Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Hale, I'm the CEO of Victory. I would like to welcome you to the GI Jobs Virtual Career Expo. For, for any transitioning service member or veteran or military spouse that's watching this opening keynote, uh, if you're not signed up yet for the Virtual Career Expo, you can do it. Uh, we've got about 850 signed up. I think we've got a little bit uh, more room left if you're interested. And you can do that by going to gijobs.com slash expos, E-X-P-O-S, like the old Montreal baseball team, gijobs.com slash expos and sign up to attend. For those who are signed up, I encourage you to get uh, over there right after this keynote. We've got some phenomenal employers uh, that are there. They want to hire you. They want to talk with you. Uh, they want to engage you. And the event is open until 4 p.m. today. So. Uh, urge you to get over there after this. Listen, I know how hard it is to transition from the military into the private sector. When I left the Navy in 2000, I found very few resources available to me to transition and what was there was not of the greatest quality. On the employer side, I found that most of corporate America really didn't understand and certainly didn't value my nine years of active duty service. Uh, my colleagues and I felt like we were pretty well trained uh, had great experiences, great qualifications, had all the intangibles, um, but just was, wasn't really recognized or valued and translated properly. So in 2001, we set out to change all of that. And we, uh, myself and two other veterans, co-founded Victory. We're now in our 20th year. We're very proud of our team. They bring their talent and their passion to work every day in support of our mission, which is to connect the military community to civilian opportunity. Our team is pretty amazing, but we are not perfect. So I want you to know uh, that we are fiercely committed to not just meeting, but exceeding your expectations. So whether you're, uh, whether you're an exhibitor or an attendee, I encourage you to fill out the satisfaction surveys at the conclusion of our event. Edgar, if you could pop those up now, uh, let us know what we did well and let us know what we didn't do so well. And I assure you that we will take that feedback and uh, we, will, we will get better with that feedback. That's good, thank you very much. Let me pop that down again. I'm broadcasting uh, live here from the GI Jobs headquarters near the Pittsburgh International Airport. Pittsburgh does not have a strong active duty presence, but it does have one of the highest percentages of veteran populations in the country. And we have a very strong guard and reserve policy, a couple of uh, Air Force Reserve units. There's a Navy operational support command here. There's a commissary and exchange, Army Reserve base. And I think there's also a uh, KC-135 uh, Pennsylvania Air National Guard unit that's located here. So our office overlooks all of it. We call it uh, the Pentagon of Pittsburgh. And speaking of Pentagon, and speaking of military units, I am incredibly honored today to be able to introduce a highly accomplished military leader and military spouse uh, of over 37 years, coming up on 37 years, including uh, his time at the Naval Academy. Our keynote speaker today has given over 42 years of active service to our United States military. Admiral Craig Fowler, currently serves as commander of U.S. Southern Command, where he commands all branches of U.S. military operations in the Caribbean and Central and South America. He commands one of only seven geographic unified combatant commands in the U.S. His military accomplishments are, as you may imagine, impressive in many. At sea, he has commanded guided missile destroyer Stetham, guided missile cruiser Shiloh, and Carrier Strike Group 3 under the USS John C. Stennis. And ashore, he has commanded Navy Recruiting Command, served mm -hmm. two senior tours in the Central Command, served as the Chief of Navy Legislative Affairs, and as the Senior Military Assistant to the Secretary of Defense. That is one hell of a career. But as a fellow Western Pennsylvanian, I want to know two things, Admiral. You're from Freiburg, PA, and you don't have to answer these now. We want to know who are the Steelers going to take in their in the NFL draft tomorrow night in the first pick. Secondly, can I'm, actually three questions? Can this can the Pirates continue this trend? And is it true that in Freiburg there are 50 white-tailed deer for every human being? So 
we'll get to that yeah. later. If you could yeah. leave those into your comments, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of questions. That's a lot of questions off the bat, Chris. Come I'm, on. I'm, lo I'm loading them up for you, sir. <laughs> uh, we are also blessed to be joined by Admiral Fowler's lovely bride, Martha. We all know. Thank you. Uh, we all know that Martha has served greatly too, and she doesn't get paid for her service. She has volunteered during her husband's entire military career in countless volunteer and leadership positions, currently serves as the CNO's Chief of Naval Operations Ombudsman at large for the U.S. Navy. Uh, Martha also serves as an Arlington lady and has volunteered with Naval Services Family Line, the Armed Forces Hostess Association, Navy Marine Corps Relief Society, and is the honorary chairman of volunteers and has performed for our wounded warriors in Tampa and Memphis uh, VA hospitals. Mrs. Fowler, I salute your selfless service. She is also a grandmother of three and a mother to two adult daughters. She is a trained vocalist, so we should have opened with a national anthem, <laughs> and, uh, a musician, and her professional career has included tenure with the Pampered Chef where she served as executive director. So listen guys, it's not every day that you get to hear perspective from a military spouse of 37 years who has experienced that journey literally from every officer rank in the Navy. So it's just a phenomenal. We are blessed to have the two of you here for the next 30 minutes or so. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Admiral Craig and Martha Fowler. Thank you. Hey, hey thanks, Chris. And uh, it's an honor to spend some time talking to our uh, such an important group of people, our veterans and their families about transition and we're always transition. So I appreciate uh, Chris uh, meeting you virtually and you putting this on. And it's always the strength of the, our non-commissioned officers, our senior enlisted that our mutual friend, uh, Master Chief uh, Petty Officer Navy retired, Mike Stevens made the, the connection here. I, I wanna have a disclaimer. Everybody's been living in virtual world and, and I've already had a couple chats to say, Admiral, close your closet door, please. Your clothes are showing, but um, I'm working from home teleworking and uh, we have two small dogs and that closet is their uh, sanctuary. And if that closet door is closed, they're gonna be barking. And uh, that's not a distraction any of us want, they'll probably bark anyway. And my lovely bride is, uh, is remotely working as well, Martha. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to be here. Thanks for including us. And I, uh, I have the privilege of being um, up with our daughter and son-in-law helping take care of our granddaughter for a couple weeks. Yeah, that's a fun, that's a, that's a fun job for all of us. But just, just to frame, we're always going through transitions uh, in the military and in life. I think the transitions in the military and the military families are more pronounced. It's the nature of our duty, our life and death duty, and it causes a constant uh, state of change and stress an opportunity and, and we just have to recognize that and we recognize uh, what you're going through. And this last year, we take a lifestyle which is, which is tremendously impactful and important and we all make such a difference. We, and, and the moves and the duty stations and the deployments and the importance mm -hmm. that our family serve too. And then we take this last year and we add a pandemic to it. And in any, everything that we've experienced uh, just went up to an nth degree of complexity. That's why I'm teleworking today. And my, my lovely wife is in a way she's working and serving our family. And so we recognize that. And some of you are in that transition right now, uh, looking for the next career opportunity, thinking about it. And it's, uh, it's hard to do in normal times, really tough to do in COVID. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate that, Martha. Oh, yeah. And thanks, honey. And for the spouses out there, too. I mean, we can only imagine the impact this has had on you, your family, your children, your friends. Um, I mean, I, I, it's very important while we're having this discussion today for you all to remember that we are not we are not perfect. Look, we have you can see my husband's clothes. We have dogs in the background. <laughs> we are and we're not trying to be perfect, but we have we have come up with a way that has served us well throughout the last almost 37 years. Um, and it's something that we reflect on daily. It's something that we work at daily. And it's, it's really become an important part of our life. Um, and we were hoping to just kind of share what we've learned 
and uh, that have helped has helped us the system that we've put together that's helped us kind of get through troubled waters. We're in in uh, in the middle of a transition ourselves, as I know a lot of you are as well. And this uh, system is called our command charter. It's a, a tool that we use to stay connected with each other and focused and um, just a good reminder of our purpose. Craig? So about 20 years ago, we attended the Navy's uh, command leadership school in Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, we, the Navy uh, encourages spouses to attend uh, as part of the education. And they, uh, they introduced us to this idea of writing a charter. So taking all the things you might believe and talk about as a, as a couple uh, and putting it down on paper, both in terms of how you're going to move your relationship forward as the centerpiece of your lives, but also do that in incredibly important roles and, and many times stressful roles so you stay centered. Uh, they teach you also to do this for your command, but we focused on doing it together uh, for each other with respect to how we would navigate the future. And we kept it alive. So we, had a, we have a 1999 version of this. What you're seeing on the screen is the 2018 version. And we use this. And we, when we decided to make a slide out of this, we wanted to go real and use the one that's folded up in our notebook rather than some pretty PowerPoint. Don't ask me about the Spanish. My Spanish isn't going too well. My wife's better at Portuguese. <laughs> uh, but uh, the top three there is, so we, we developed this in 99 and we used it through command tours. Uh, Chris went through those. I don't need to repeat them. And we found it kept us centered and was a, was a go-to. It's almost like our, our 10 commandments, but there's six first principles at the bottom of, of our relationship as a centerpiece of our lives. And <clears throat> as we look at, this entering our command and and we assumed command here at Southern Command in November of 2018. If you'd have told me we would have utilized this, <clears throat> excuse me, this tool to to navigate through a pandemic, I would have said, "No, I'm not a pandemic in the 21st century." But we had a pandemic in the 21st century, and so we really leveraged this. And I, I'll start and just kind of break this down on the top three, and then Martha will hit the questions, and then we'll go to first principles. But Having some way of prioritization and thinking about your life together or your own life, if you're sitting here today and, and you're, you're single and you're moving forward, time's our most important resource and variable. And, and what do you do with that time? And how do you, how do you make the best use of it? Because you never gain it back. And despite trying for years, Department of Defense has not been able to make a 24 hour and greater days long. We sure do try. So those first three, ones are about time and how important time is. And we don't get it, as Martha said, we don't get it right. We're not perfect at all, but we work at it. Mar? Well, and then, thanks, honey. And then the second part is key questions. We found it's really, really helpful and important to ask ourselves these key questions. And so we wrote them down. Are we staying humble? Do people trust us? Are we focused on serving others? Are we learning? Are we learning about others, about each other? Right now, currently, are we learning about uh, where we are, where our, our main focus is, which is on Latin America and the Caribbean? Um, and really important is how do we want to be remembered? Craig? And the, uh, and the questions are key. And they're hard to answer and hard to keep focused on because they really are almost an assessment mechanism. And then we turn these into principles. And the, and the principles, as you see, are, are as much about each other as they are about our outward team. Kindness, patience, judgment, listening, loving, lifting. Probably could have added learning. There's, mm -hmm. uh, there's so much to this. So enter the pandemic. This is important to us, this list, this charter of ours on any given day. And then we enter the pandemic and we broke down these first principles that you see here to a couple, to a few, four to be exact, more specific items that we wanted to focus on in how we related to our command. And South Com's uh, headquarters of about 1500, but all total we have 
about 5,000 across the US in our smaller component commands, and then in 25 embassies where military personnel reside, and then some out uh, doing important operations day in and day out. And so that then drove us to uh, our derivation of this. And we can just talk through this. You can go ahead, Edgar, and take the, the slide down. So the first principle that we derive from that list is, is keeping everyone informed and keeping them together. And uh, I think if you're communicating uh, and you're part of a transition today and you're looking for a new job and you're, you're, probably, you're probably not tr communicating enough to your inner circle and your family about what you're going through and what you need. And I think that applies uh, day in and day out as well as a crisis. And I have a saying, if, you're, if you think you're communicating effectively, you're probably sliding into communication oblivion. Uh, it's just a way of reminding ourselves that uh, that's something that's got to be focused on constantly. And there's lots of ways to do it. Email is probably one of the least effective, but it's a method. Walking around gets to be tough in a pandemic, but uh, we found that walking around uh, in our headquarters, myself, Command Sergeant Major, because Martha couldn't come in, was really useful way to stay connected to uh, the team so they could see a human. Martha? Well, I'm being transparent, empathetic, listening, making sure that because we are in a transition ourselves, making sure that both of us know each other's expectations as we're trying to navigate our way uh, every single day and, and trying to figure out what, um, what lies ahead. And we do that by staying connected uh, and being in completely intentional. I mean, we have to really work at it because I mean, our, our lives are just really busy. It's just the way it is. And the way we stay connected and try to stay connected is um, calendar updates. We do one every Sunday after church, daily walks, uh, finding, um, finding a way that, that helps you stay centered, helps you find peace. And for me, that's through prayer, uh, daily meditation, uh, just to help manage stress. Craig? Right. So the first, first principle of this pandemic, which is, um, I think, the truly most stressful time any of us have seen, even those of us have been in combat, was keeping everyone informed and together. The second one, as Martha said, was being transparent, empathetic, and listening. And the third one was being accessible. And so it, how, are you, how are you accessible if you really can't have meetings, you can't be in groups? How are you accessible if you're in the midst of a transition, new job, and you're in the middle of a move, and, and uh, all you have is your phone? Part of that for us is, is um, establishing a routine. So Martha mentioned, I think there's a real connection between the routine, sitting down together as a couple for a, a weekly schedule meeting, and making that centerpiece of the week and feeling really feeling bad if it gets missed, really keeping yourself and your team, your family team, your your friends, your cohorts, those folks that are helping you in transition on the same sheet of music is so important. So for us, we create mm -hmm. a virtual, uh, we, we use in military, we call it battle rhythm. We just came up with a fancy name, military, but just meetings. So instead of doing a stand-up meeting in the morning, a virtual platform, and instead of narrowing it and inviting only the top three or four or five leaders in the command, we put out, hey, anybody who wants to join that virtual platform can. And so this morning we had at eight o'clock, 22 people dial in and only four or five of them spoke. I actually truly don't mind who this is in. We have no secrets. It, it goes back to that, that whole transparency thing. But being accessible does include making a routine. And I think as we approach our own retirement later this year, that becomes so much more important uh, uh, for me each passing minute, each passing year, because that's how we, we manage time. And that's how we manage our own expectations. Mar? Well, and, and the other one, um, the other point that I think is really, really important to talk about is building trust. You know, starting by looking in the mirror and asking yourself daily, who, who trusts me? And one of the things that's really important um, to do when you're in a transition is to make sure that the people that you're still working with know that you are completely invested in them, that you're, you have, you're present, you haven't moved on yet, that they are still important, 
you're, you value them, that you are committed to um, working towards what's going to benefit them for us, our command family, and um, still all the while making sure that Craig and I know each other's expectations and working on um, what we need to do to make, to just make our transition work as well. Craig? Um, Trust, trust is the glue. So those sort, those mm. from our command charter, we derive those four first principles that really have helped us uh, focus on what's most important and helped our command and ourselves through a period of great change and transition. And you all are, have experienced that up front. So keeping everyone informed and together, being transparent and empathetic and listening. Number two, being accessible and then building trust. Uh, mm -hmm. and, so as we go forward, uh, and we showed you the command charter, there are no, there's just no right or wrong answers here, but having some guideposts and, and committing to put them down on paper has proven to be really useful for us as a way to ensure we're being consistent, we're staying focused, and we're, we're, we're savoring every minute of every day as well as looking forward. Mark? Yeah, and you know this this command charter, this system that we use, it's it's yours to use too, and hopefully, um, hopefully never never lose. I mean, I I have my crumpled up um, copy that I keep in my in my Bible that I use every day, and I it just makes me smile to know how long we've been using this. Um, and it also makes me smile to just know that I have the original copy, but really it's a it's just a system that we wanted to share with you that has been um proven helpful to us and it is continuing to be helpful we're going to continue to use it once we've transitioned and moved on to this next chapter and we hope that it's it's provided some value for you as well no matter what you're doing transition you you're experiencing right now or challenges that you're going through we hope that this will be helpful and we really look forward to answering your questions. Yeah, thanks, honey. I, she, Martha, we, we vary where we keep these. We try to make it someplace that that we intersect with in our routine. And one tour, we hung it. We were in a really tiny little 1,200 <laughs> square foot rented cottage, and uh, we hung it over the master shoes because you got to get to your shoes every day. And we were sharing the shoe rack, and uh, we had to move it. We put it in plastic, and it was it kind of became a joke and. We still have that same copy that we used that was in 2001. Mm -hmm. we'd, love take, we'd love to take your questions, share our experience and thoughts and ideas. So thanks a lot for allowing us uh, to uh, share some time here today. Thank you. Yeah, Admiral, Mrs. Fall, really good stuff. Um, very appropriate. I think, uh, listen, I, I think we all appreciate uh, you guys kind of letting us into your homes, uh, letting us uh, see you with your hair down a little bit and uh it's just re really refreshing to know uh <laughs> uh to to know that uh to kind of humanize people of your uh of your status it's really great um you know you guys mentioned and first of all just echo anybody that has questions go ahead and submit them in the chat and then we'll take a few of those uh, we'll have some time to take a few of those now um the uh you know in military transition, and most of the audience here today is in that transition period, you know, they talk about the two most, two of the most stressful times in your life is when you change jobs and uh, when you move. And for most mm -hmm. of our service members who are transitioning out of the military, um, it, it always, always includes obviously the new job. And in most cases, they're going to move as well. So it's kind of that double stressor. And um, as well as really leaving the military and losing that identity, that identity piece, right? The uniform and, and all the accomplishments, the sense of belonging to something larger than yourself. And I think this uh, command charter really helps anchor everybody to a, a core set of principles. So thank you guys for, uh, for putting that out to us. Um, first question we have here is uh, for, for Admiral Fowler, you're gonna be transitioning in six months. So what, are your, what is your preparation for that? And uh, what does that, what kind of things are you looking at post-military? Yeah, thanks for the question. And, and somebody asked if they could see the slide again. I think that we, you could push the slide and then we can keep it up while the, because I think our video still shows on the panel 
uh, I'm okay with that. Is that if it works for you, Mark. Oh, sure. Right. So, um, you no, know, we're uh, so thanks for laying all those variables out there, Chris. Right, that you're trying to hold down one job, you're and you're, it's an important job, and every single person who served is an important job. Uh, trying to work your family forward through change, uh, and uh, and you're sprinting uh, to the last minute while preparing for the next. So it is a it is a time of uh, big change and can be stressful. So we. The services all act, uh, offer transition courses. I think they have taken feedback like yours, Chris, over the years and improved them. Uh, we attended together virtually, which was a great way to do it. So there was not this mm -hmm. burden on having to travel to some fleet concentration area, which just was unnecessary given what we know about IT now. That allowed us to really sit together and dialogue in our home environment. That was really useful, just all the nuts and bolts on insurance and uh, in healthcare and VA and everyone out there has to navigate through. So that was good. We then did what they said and we made a checklist. Everybody loves a good checklist. Martha's better at me at checklists. She she gets them done too. And then uh, and then I've got a list of people to talk to. So I think that's one of the suggestions they made. I kind of knew I was going to do it. And I have a good list and I'm trying to knock those out uh, systematically. Old mentors, people I don't know. Not to job hunt. I'm not going to job hunt until I, I actually uh, retire. I don't think I can do that and do two things at once. And that would be to me, in my role, a lot of the, uh, most of the people need to job hunt while they're doing it. But I, in my role, I don't just think that's the right thing to do. So, bottom line is talk to a lot of people just to help frame the the way forward because I want to make sure we still have that sense of purpose about service. It's just going to shift. It's going to be service of family uh, as much as service of uh, nation. And Mara, any thoughts on that? You know, we've talked a lot about um, transition and what a privilege it's been to be have this military adventure, this military journey, this military honor to serve our country. But with three grandchildren and daughters and son-in-laws that we adore, you know, when you can, we've made, we've worked hard at trying to make a difference and I'm looking forward to continuing making, to make a difference in just a, a different way. Now where the focus will be more on um, our grandchildren and being able to have that flexibility to spend time with them. So I, I think about, um, you know, Chris, you said you talked about how hard it is to leave that identity of being in the military behind, but what a privilege it will be to be able to just make a difference in a different way. Absolutely. Um, good stuff. You, know, it, you talk about military spouse and we've got a fair number of military spouses at today's event. Um, can you, can you elaborate Martha, on how the military spouse uh, role has changed over the last 37 years, you know, from, I, and I, I recall being in Keflavik, Iceland, and uh, on deployment with my P3 squadron, calling my wife once a week with a budget because it was like $2 a minute, I think, to call her from the phone booth, and this was in the early 90s, uh, to call back home and talk to my wife. Uh, things are so much different from a technology perspective. Uh, but still a lot of the same stressors that fall upon a military spouse who doesn't get paid for what she does. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit on how that, how you've seen that change over the years? Sure. And, you know, it's funny. Our first daughter was born when, um, our oldest daughter was born when Craig was deployed. And uh, in order for him to hear her cry for the first time, he was in a phone booth and people were feeding him change. So that sounds very familiar, what you just said. But you know when we, I mean, when we, um, when we came into the military back in the in the early '80s, th there were no computers. We did not have cell phones. Um, I remember many, many times during deployments where I would just hope if I went outside, I wouldn't miss Craig's call. And um, you know, there were times that I I did. And even when you had a call, it was only you know just a few minutes, but just to hear each other's voice. I still have our letter boxes that we would make um, and keep our letters in, uh, and you know, and now, 
and so there, there are wonderful things about that time period because you, the way you stayed connected was so intentional and you just, you, you found, you were very creative in ways that you could stay connected. Now, what's really great is you can still stay connected, but it's just so instant. And I, I've been in with the ombudsman program since 1984 uh, when we were first, first got married. And I remember, um, you know, the cases that we would have and the struggles that people would have, they seemed more um, back then only because it was so hard to get in touch with, you know, your loved one. Well, now you, you've got an instant connection, uh, depending on what you're doing. I know in the Navy, you, you, you're connected to the ship through internet. And so you, you're always in connection. Um, I just, you know, I think to being a military spouse, the being empowered to go out there and make a difference, no matter where you are, you're an ambassador for our military, the community, that's the way they're going to get to know and learn about our community, our Navy or our military, whatever service you're in is through you, through the, the, um, through the example that we set as military spouses. I just think being a military spouse is an amazing opportunity and sure you don't get paid in monetary sense, but you get paid in so many other ways. I mean, to all the experiences that we've had, these life experiences and places we've lived, it's, 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 uh, I mean, there, it's invaluable. There is no way that you could repay that. Yeah. You can't, you can't write a book. You can't write a screenplay like that. It's real life. Um, mm -hmm. Roxanne C. Roxanne C. I'm taking some questions from the audience here. Um, let's see. Uh, Angelo Devine, or yeah, Devine, how long have you been married? And then makes a comment, has the military stress on your marriage and how did you overcome that? And also comments that uh, Angelo likes the fact that you've put priorities in order by putting God first. So you've been married 37 years, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, 37 talk, years. talk about the faith part of that for, for, uh, for you guys. Yeah, I think that, I think faith is something that's so important. Um, it's essential to being in the military, right? We swear allegiance to a constitution and uh, true faith and allegiance. It's not just faith. They say true faith and allegiance. And, uh, and I think believing in something bigger than yourself uh, is, is important. So I'll leave it up to individuals to make that choice. We believe in God and we, we practice that and we try to uh, live that out. You'll go deployment. You won't get to go to church together, but you can certainly pray together and use that faith as a glue uh, to help really think through complicated problems. Uh, and faith in the institution, no matter how imperfect the institution may be, the institution of the United States, the Constitution is, is and for those in the military we, that are married, you swear, uh, there's only a couple times you ever swear oaths in your life. One is your wedding vows, another is your, the oath that you swear when you're enlisting, re-enlisting. And so I think really there's key, that's key. And it, I think it resonates in the charter. We probably didn't design it. With that mind but it's what we believe and and what we think and i and i just say that that's important is it, the military i think the question was about stress absolutely uh you got to trust each other and there's there's plenty of time when you're apart and and um and things where you may not communicate whether it's finances or how to approach child rearing or those sorts of things i've been part of i've been investigated uh, for a long time um, again, I say I'm not a perfect person. I've made mistakes, but I've always been an ethical person. And knowing that, and knowing that my wife's an ethical person, is key to being to being a part of that faith that keeps you together. Mm -hmm. and especially when it's it's dark times. It's not all it's not all just a beautiful uh, ladder with roses on the side as you move up in the military. There's a lot of rungs in the ladder that are creaky and broken, and uh, and you end up misstepping and falling down and there's a lot of pressure on you especially when you many times feel like you're living in a fishbowl with uh, everybody watching every move huh, honey no thanks craig i i mean faith is really important to me and the reason why is because 
I find a lot of comfort in knowing that um, I don't have to be in control, that especially when we are apart, that I know that, um, that God is watching out for us, whether we're together or apart. Uh, that just brings me personally a lot of peace. Uh, there are, I mean, like Craig said, there are, have been times in our military career where, I mean, it has not been perfect. It has really been challenging, but to have something that you can cling to that gives you strength and courage and hope is so important to us. And, and to have that together is really, really comforting. One of my favorite scriptures is from the book of Jeremiah. And it says, I know the plans I have for you, plans of hope and a future, not to harm you. That scripture verse, I repeat to myself daily because it just helps me keep, stay focused and stay on the path that I know that Craig and I have talked about and what we're working for together. Good stuff, guys. Hey, Ro Roxanne C. asks, um, how has your charter, how has your command charter vary? How does it vary whether you're living together or apart? It doesn't. That's what's so great is, I mean, we, it doesn't vary. I mean, I, it's just stays, keeps us focused. And that's, what's so important about it because we both, we both look at the same thing. And so that we stay on the same page. Right. You, you know, it's interesting. If you sit down and you ask, you, you actually like at dinner say, okay, we're going to answer one of those questions. There is a tendency to say, no, nah, yeah, we got that. And not get into the next level of detail that would then allow you to share a recent experience to find out that you might have this perception or didn't even realize that you were uh, drifting off course uh, with respect to staying centered on some of the principles. I think that um, mm -hmm. we undervalue our uh, the alignment of our own hearts and minds sometimes, the need to get them aligned. You know, mm -hmm. it's funny. I think I, we. I think a lot of us, you know, naturally subscribe to core beliefs or core ba or core values in the organizations that we join. You know, whether that's a church or whether that's uh, where we work um, or other fraternal organizations. But um, you know, as I was listening to you guys speak, you know, I said to myself, I don't know if I've got core beliefs or core values or this sort of anchoring type of uh, you know thing in my own family. And I don't know why it should, right? And I think, uh, you know, if it's, if it's things that are important enough to define uh, in an organization, it's certainly important enough to do in your own family. So uh, just mm -hmm. really great, great stuff and kind of anchoring you to some of the things that, uh, that join us all together. Um, so can we get to some of the uh, questions at, at the beginning, sir? Can you give us a few <laughs> fast facts about Freiburg? can't say that very fast yeah we'll get that I, I see another one from uh rich and uh we'll get there's a couple more to answer there but yeah fast facts so Steelers draft don't know I haven't paid much attention to Steelers draft I, I am a Steelers fan uh, I, don't, I don't know you you can be from western Pennsylvania and not be a Steelers fan Pirates 500 hey let's go keep it going I've I've caught Pirates out of the high seas those Pirates will always be bad our Pirates are going to be good someday and then the 50 to one ratio of deer to people in Freiburg is, is probably actually a higher, it's probably more deer than people than that. <laughs> you got it. So yeah, so back, so back to Rich. So uh, he says, Admiral, Mrs. Fowler, do you have a particular experience that offered you the most personal growth that you will carry with you in your next endeavor? Hard to identify one, there's the certainly many. I think that deployments are uh, a centering on that. We've had many of those ranging from just a few months to eight. And, uh, and those deployments have been uh, a test that we've, we've came through. I think you come through things. Fire uh, is, uh, you know, this is saying that iron, iron forges iron and strength. And I think that's very true uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. I think being under investigation for an extended period of time where you're getting the people are questioning your ethical compass uh, is very is very difficult. You wake up two in the morning, hey, why, why, why is this happening? Why can't it get cleared up? I believe that I did all the right things. 
Uh, and then that, that test is a, really had been a test for us of what's important. Uh, that charter helped and we, we made it through. Mark? No, you know, um, just going back to that time, that period of time where, where Craig was under investigation, I mean, that was, that was really challenging because I, I always, I kept clinging to the saying that the truth will set you free. And when, how long it would take for the truth to come out, you know, we didn't know that, but I, I did cling to that. And one day I was having, I was going, it was a few years into it. And I, I just was really having struggling this one day. And I sat down and I thought, I'm going to write down all the things that I, I actually can be grateful for because we're going through this challenging time. And at first I thought that's ridiculous. I won't be able to come up with anything, but you know, I came up with an entire page of all of these things that has happened as a blessing because of this challenging time and it that i will carry with me forever because and i and i hope i can share it with other people our children our grandchildren and be reminded of that daily myself because no matter what you're going through there are still so many blessings around so many things to still be thankful for even in a time of a pandemic there are so many things to still be grateful for. And, and that's important to me to be, to remember. I think ultimately, if you can say, I walk within my own house with integrity in my heart, then you can, you can know that you have things to be grateful for. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Hey, uh, we've got just a, a couple of minutes left. I just, would just ask each of you to give us some parting words. So uh, with our audience who, are actively seeking civilian employment today. Uh, we talk all the time about the litany of things that, uh, that intangibles, right, that you learn in military service that are translatable into the private sector. Um, not always directly, um, but, but oftentimes indirectly. So I just ask uh, either words of wisdom or some takeaways from military service that you think are directly translatable into the private sector to give our, uh, our audience uh, confidence going into this uh, virtual career expo. Right, whether you served four or 40, uh, you, you, you did things, you accomplished something, you showed a ability to stay committed and get things done. And I think everybody values that. You also, whether you knew it or not, as you said, Chris, you were aligned to, to a set of values, the, the core values that each service has. And so you, you did things, you did things with an ethical compass appointed in the right direction. You know how to plan, you're resilient. Those are huge skills that, that you demonstrated. You might've already had them, but you demonstrated them time and time again uh, to move through your journey. And that's something to embrace, be proud of. And I think I'm not too good at selling myself, but however you need to explain that and tell your own story to an employer, Mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to to just stay determined, stay hopeful. Um, again, just going back to a scripture verse that I really uh, cling to during our own transition is from Galatians that says, let us not go weary, let us not grow weary in doing good for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. So just don't give up. Excellent, excellent stuff. Appreciate it so much. You two are uh, you two are inspiring, and we uh, we just really are blessed to be able to uh, see some insight into uh, uh, into your lives today. And uh, we really appreciate the transparency and you guys sharing some some details of your relationship and what's made it work for so long. Um, you guys are amazing patriots. It's no secret uh, why you've been allowed to serve for so long. Uh, at very high levels. And we just, uh, we really appreciate you being with us here today. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, and the dogs didn't bark. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> very good. Thank you all. And uh, at, at this point, we'll head back over to the Virtual Career Expo. Uh, lots of employers over there waiting to talk with transitioning service members, veterans, and military spouses. Thank you to the followers. That's all we've got. <laughs>